All right, good morning. Welcome to the uh, March edition of our Grand Rounds. Today we have Dr. Julie Spencer with us. She uh, graduated from University of Scranton with her uh, her Master's of Physical Therapy and then returned to the University of Scranton for her Doctor of Physical Therapy. She uh, is treating patients at our Center Valley Clinic um, and she specializes in women's health, men's health, and pelvic floor health. So, uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Julie. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so, sorry, we're a little bit late, but luckily I talk super fast. So, I think we should get through everything um, in relatively quick time. Um, so here we are, female pelvic girdle instability, digging deeper. So I figured this title would either bring everybody here or push everybody away. <laughs> so um, I do um, specialize in treating um, the pelvic floor and um, uh, women's health. Um, but my background is actually, and just like most physical therapists in orthopedics, and I was an athlete um, in high school and college. And so really all I used to want to treat was sports and orthopedics. And if you ever told me at that point that I'd be treating the pelvic floor and women's health, I would tell you that you were crazy. Um, but then um, I started to get a um, real big interest in the pregnant women, uh, the pregnant woman, um, probably about three to five years into like my career. And I realized that they were like an orthopedic dream. Like, why are we not looking at these women as like an orthopedic kind of disaster? You know, like this is like all this, stuff, all these changes are happening and yes, they're normal, but Look at all the stuff that's happening in them. Is anybody taking care of these women? And so that kind of, long story short, got me into women's health and eventually pelvic floor training. And I found something that I am completely in love with. Um, and the funny thing is uh, learning how to treat women that are pregnant and postpartum and the pelvic floor incontinence and all those kinds of things really has actually led me to become a much better orthopedic and sports physical therapist. Um, really having respect for the pelvic girdle and all the strategies we need to keep the stability or get it back um really has made me look at all body parts um, a lot differently and that's kind of what i'm hoping is going to come out of a little bit of what we're talking about today so um, i have been trained in pelvic floor um, internal exams looking at the pelvic floor in high tone i do treat incontinence um dyspareunia which means like painful intercourse um and i started utilizing internal releases um, with some of my orthopedic patients when i started with st luke's in 2005 so that's kind of how i started combining the two together um, where a lot of people that had this like uh, piriformis and sciatic um, pain, um, and they would get like, you know, I don't know, a certain amount, 80%, 90% better with regular PT treatments. And then um, I would say to them, listen, I think there might be something else going on that I can access. If they're comfortable, I had to be selective about it. They had to be comfortable with it. They had to be really motivated. And I would kind of take them to my back room where I did pelvic floor stuff and check out some stuff internally. And we would find that that was like that last little bit of the puzzle that we weren't seeing before. Um, so I kind of um, started doing that on my own. <laughs> and then I started telling everybody I work with, like, you guys got to look at this as a part of what's going on. So um, ironically, as I progress, I don't know if it's something that I'm just more aware of or something that really is happening, but there's kind of an increase in frequency in these like um, very general diagnoses of like groin pain, hip pain, even proximal hamstring tendinopathy and all these kinds of things, um, especially for females. And a lot of them seem to be like maybe five, 10, even longer postpartum. Um, and I'm kind of looking at like, why, why is this happening? It's a lot of times idiopathic. They have this generalized pain and, and weakness, um, but it's enough that it's kind of stopping them from sport or activity. And where is this coming from? Yes, they might have these symptoms of sciatica, piriformis pain, hamstring tenderness, but where is this really coming from? What's the driver? Um, so luckily I work with some great people in my office and they listen to me day in, day out talking about the pelvic floor and the importance of it for stability. And we're kind of working together um, where they might see them and do their orthopedic assessment and say, hey, listen, I think this might be a piece. And they're talking to their patients saying, what do you think about checking out some of these other muscles that might be a piece of your puzzle? Um, and it's funny because as we kind of looked into it further, there's really not a lot of research out there. It's kind of exciting to kind of try to fit this puzzle together. There's not a lot of information out there about um, treating the pelvic floor for orthopedic injuries and vice versa. So um, it's kind of fun right now. Um, so what this won't be, I don't want to freak everybody out. We're not going to do internal exam work. We're not going to look talk, talk much about incontinence or um, painful intercourse. Uh, but we still have to have a little bit of pelvic floor stuff in there. So um, this is our uh, female pelvic floor. Um, there's two pieces. There's two main areas of it. So there's an anterior portion here and the posterior portion here. 
Um, and then there's a superficial layer and a deep layer. So this is basically the superficial layer here, and it's kind of uh, some things are obviously cut. And here's a deeper layer, this levator ani group here, which actually still goes underneath the superficial layer here. Um, that's our driver for pelvic stability. There's actually, when we learn pelvic floor therapy, we learned about three main S's as their function. Support, uh, basically if the pelvic floor isn't there, everything would kind of fall out. Um, sphincteric, which means it helps to stop and start the flow of urine and, and your bowels. Um, and then um, uh, sexual function, which we all kind of know that that's a piece of it. But there's actually a fourth S that's starting to come into play now, which they're talking about um, strategies, stabilizing strategies. How much is the pelvic floor a part of just lumbopelvic stability and the stability in our body in general? Um, but also when we're talking about the pelvic girdle, obviously it's not just the pelvic floor. We're talking about the hip. Mostly in this, take, in this case, we're talking about the posterior aspect um, and the muscles of the hip. Um, and of course, the um, SI joint in the pelvis. We can see all those like great ligamentous um, supports, the great ligamentous support system of the pelvis and the SI. Um, this sacro tuberous ligament is one of my favorites. We're talking about pregnancy on even just the um, hypermobile pelvis. This actually has some fibers that kind of connect right here um, at the ischial tuberosity with the proximal hamstring. So a lot of times we're talking about this proximal hamstring tendinopathy. This is another um, area we want to kind of palpate and see if this is a source of some of that pain that they have with sitting and stuff like that. Is it the hamstring? Is it more the sacro tuberous ligament? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then this is like my favorite muscle, my love, the obturator internus. Um, it's, a, it's a hidden muscle, I think, often. It's often overlooked and very often overused. Um, we can access it both for internal palpation, which is what I started um, doing a lot with my patients, but there's actually a way that you can access it and palpate it for those of that you don't know, externally, where a patient mostly in sideline and you kind of get around the um, rim of the um, ischial tuberosity and you can palpate kind of the edge of the obturator there and find out if that's a piece of the puzzle and part of the driving force of some of the pain that they might be having. Um, we'll talk about that again a little bit later, but um, this is the view that I usually have <laughs> of the obturator internus. And again, you can see the relationship between the pelvic floor muscles. So here's that area here that we're talking about, the sphincter levator ani, and here's the obturator. It's actually you know, a hip rotator, but we access this the muscle belly of it internally. And here's another great picture. This is the piriformis taken away. And here's the obturator. You can see how it kind of comes around the obturator notch here. So um, when we palpate that, um, we can feel, we can reproduce pain a lot of times. Um, that pain that they're having, this pain with sitting or this pain into the deep glute, um, kind of that sciatica pain. It's really funny because sometimes, we, you know, we can feel it when they're stretching or might dig into their piriformis and like, yeah, yeah, that's it. But when I press this muscle, they're like, oh my God, that is it. That's the pain I've been having. Um, and it's usually this muscle that's kind of on fire. Um, this is a great picture. I show this a lot to my patients because they can't understand why when I'm palpating one muscle, how are they feeling pain in the groin and in the buttocks and everything. So we can see here where the origin is kind of right around the pubic rami and the rim here. And then here's the muscle belly. And then it comes around the obturator notch and it actually has um, common um, insertion with the piriformis muscle right around the um, greater throat center there. And it's actually an external rotator on the hip. Um, but when we palpate here, depending on where I come in internally and palpate, um, if we come kind of more anteriorly around the border, they might reproduce some groin pain, sometimes superpubic pain, um, anteriorly, almost like an inguinal type of um, um, pain and dissipation. And then if we kind of go to the muscle belly, it's kind of deep in the hip. And then if I kind of go posteriorly, they'll feel that like kind of sciatica, deep glute pain. It's not really, it's very small, like changes in where you're palpating, but just one little change of direction completely changes where they're feeling their pain. And again, it can very often reproduce it. And often it's asymmetrical side to side, obviously. Um, its function is a hip external rotator and a hip internal rotator decelerator, which is really important to know for when we are rehabbing it, if we're looking at this as part of the puzzle because we really want to focus on eccentrics. Um, and also its stability for the hip joint itself. Um, this is very often my view of the of pelvic floor again with the obturator. Um, but again, I love this picture because you can kind of see how it's really the bridge between the, uh, of the pelvic girdle between the hip and the pelvic floor. And if we have instability somewhere, you can see how that obturator might be really overworking there. If we're releasing the piriformis, if we're releasing everything around the hamstring, we're stretching everything out, um, and we're lacking stability, then something's got to grab on for stability. And that obturator is usually the one that's doing that. One of the things that we notice when I'm palpating the um, 
arbitrator internist, when it is on fire, two things will happen with it. Either it's the um, it's overcompensating for the pelvic floor. If the pelvic floor is weak, sometimes we kind of kick in everything. We kick in the glutes, we kick in the multifidi, um, and a lot of times we're kicking in this obturator. And other times um, the obturator is just kind of the only thing clinging on for dear life. Like I said, if we're lacking um, SI stability, um, and we have all these other pains all over the place and we're stretching everything out and all those things are supposed to be providing us with stability. Something's got to give us stability. So it's kind of like this, I tell people it's like a swing set in the ground. Um, you know, those metal swing sets in the park when, well, they're still there, but it's mostly when I was <laughs> younger, I guess. Um, and when they're kind of loose in the ground, you swing and the swing jerks all over. It's kind of fun. But the SI joint should be that swing set straight into the ground. It should be planted there really nicely with its ligaments and things like that. But if it's not, if there's a mobility problem and it's kind of coming out of the ground, that swing's gonna be jerking all over the place. So if our legs are the swing and we don't have a stable swing set in the ground, our legs are gonna be jerking all over the place when we move. But nobody's walking around kind of with these jelly legs. So something's gotta give it stability. And very often we might find that it's all these compens compensatory patterns and a lot of times the obturator internus is part of that. So we're talking about lumbar pelvic stability. Um, Diane Lee and um, Andrew Vleeming in 1998 came out with this beautiful um, uh, four components for pelvic, um, lumbar pelvic stability. I think all of these have to be really taken into consideration when we're talking about the female. So we have form closure, force closure, motor control, and neural patterning, and then awareness and response to emotional factors. I think that's a huge thing, especially when it comes to females. So obviously, I think most of us know form closure. That's the um, bony and ligamentous component. We know that the SI joint fits really well together. It has this crazy amount of tough ligaments around it. Um, and I think at one point, I remember in PT school, them saying there's no, there's no movement at the SI joint. It doesn't move. And I remember when I first came out of school, there was this like PT that was like, so smart. I loved him. His name was Sean. And um, I thought he like knew everything. He was like, oh, there's no movement at the SI joint. None. Um, but I'm a female and I've had many times where my pelvis is moving, whether it's during my menstrual cycle. Um, I've been pregnant three times. One of them was a multiple gestation pregnancy. The SI joint moves. I can tell you that without a doubt. Um, and obviously, I think we know more and more research is out there that even when you're not pregnant, there's a lot of mobility that comes out of the SI joint. So then we need forced closure, right? If the SI joint was perfect, we wouldn't need all this stuff. But we need muscles, gravity, or the connective tissue really working together to stabilize that joint. So um, for the pelvic girdle and spe uh, specifically, we're talking about a couple of main muscle groups. So with the SI joint and the pelvis, we're talking about the diaphragm, transverse abdominis, the multifidi, and the levator ani. And for the hip, we're looking really at those rotators again, um, and the glutes and the abductors, obturator internus, piriformis, and gluteals. Not necessarily saying that the adductors are so like not the hip flexors all that doesn't have a, a part in it but this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about limbo pelvic stability here is um one of my favorite um things to talk about with my patients is the abdominal cylinder or the canister so basically intra-abdominal pressure is achieved by like kind of contracting a lot of these muscles together the diaphragm the pelvic floor the abdominal uh, abdominal muscles and sometimes the multifidi um but really we want to counteract the, the intra-abdominal pressure with all these muscles working in like this beautiful orchestra of, orchestra of movement. So um, we know, um, again, we do a lot of this in pelvic floor training, a lot of PRI um, training talks about this, but the diaphragm is a huge component of stability and um, preparation and anticipation and reaction to movement um, in order for these like strategies to really work in our core. So the diaphragm itself works with the pelvic floor really nicely. If the diaphragm contracts, the pelvic floor contracts, and the diaphragm relaxes, the pelvic floor relaxes. If you all think about it, and if it's a hard thing to um, remember, if you think about coughing or sneezing, that's a forceful, exert, a forceful exhalation, and that's when the diaphragm contracts up. And obviously, a lot of us have been through it where we don't want to pee when <laughs> we're coughing, laughing, or sneezing, so that we know that, technically speaking, the pelvic floor should be pulling up, right? We want to stop any of that leaking. So the diaphragm is contracting, the pelvic floor is contracting. And then the abdominals and multifidi are obviously working together to stabilize the compression forces um, anterior and posteriorly. And we need synergistic, synergistic function of these muscles to achieve stability and function without pain. Um, so what is this? all kind of mean that if all these things are not working well together, if any of these pieces of this intra-abdominal or this uh, abdominal canister are not working, we're having some type, of, some type of dysfunction and they have to be working balanced. Um, they also have to be preparing for motion. They have to anticipate motion. They have to prepare for it and then they have to react. And then they have to do that moment to moment. So um, one of the studies that we that is out there is that um, intra-abdominal pressure, when it increases, the pelvic floor has to anticipate that before it even happens forward mechanism and then has to recruit for optimal um, recruit well for optimal SI stability. So basically the pelvic floor, the diaphragm, the multifidi, and the transverse, transverse abdominis all have to say, okay, what's going on? 
I have to kind of process all this information in a split second and then react accordingly. And then they have to do it in a really balanced way. And kind of leads us into these neuromotor strategies, um, which is basically motion control of the joints. There's a great um, definition out there which says the timely uh, that motor control is the timely activation of various muscle groups such as such that the co-activation pattern occurs at minimal cost to the musculoskeletal system. So we want it to work well, but we want it to also be really efficient. Poor neuromotor patterns obviously last, uh, lead to lasting compensatory strategies. So if our neuro neuromotor strategies are off in the pelvis um, and we're not able to prepare enough to counterbalance those forces, whether we're in IADLs, like, you know, just getting up out of a chair, or we're doing something super dynamic, like, you know, gymnastics or running or something like that, or in a stable position, like sitting still and kind of contracting these muscles, or in some type of uneven surface or dynamic movement, like walking, um, we have to have those strategies working all the time. If we're not, we're leading to these compensatory strategies, which is going to lead to dysfunction. Um, so here are some great quotes that are found in research. I'm just going to kind of translate them for you. So the first thing means um, that we need strategies to stabilize the pelvis on the SI joint while we're preparing for this load that comes onto SI joint in our pelvis, but also at the same time, how is the pelvis going to react while it um, coordinates with the femur for dynamic movement? The second thing basically says what we said before, that we need to prepare Re, um, preemptively and then react to uh, movement on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So it's not just something that we sit here and teach somebody to do like sitting here. Okay, make sure you can, can you know, work in all these muscles together. We have to make sure that they can bring that into their function. It's very similar to like when you have um, uh, any kind of injury to the knee and you're doing some type of like quad set, quad set retraining. You're going to do like, you know, however, 100 quad sets on the mat or something. And then you say, okay, your quad is strong. Go ahead and go play soccer. That's not going to happen. You have to make sure that they're going to take that strength and put it into function, that the, the quadriceps is going to fire strategically in function. Um, and then the last one basically says we need the most efficient, balanced strategies of the muscles, the pelvic girdle, during functional movement, where basically we're going to come up with these, again, compensatory strategies. Um, so the ultimate goal is to teach the patient a healthier way to live and move. Live and move. This is something these um, systems should be firing at low levels at all times. And then, the, you know, of course, anticipating movement from the central nervous system, then we react to, like, greater forces. Um, but we should be living and moving in such that sustained compression and neurotensile forces on any one structure are avoided. So basically, everything is in balance. That fourth component um, to that lumbopelvic stability is its response to emotion. Um, and basically, Vleeming said, the dynamic orchestration of... Uh, uh, muscular actions is regulated by the central nervous system, which is strongly um, controlled by emotion. So if we think about any of our teenage athletes going through their just, you know, puberty changes that every single thing is like a disaster, um, or just a female teenager itself doesn't have to be an athlete, right? Um, uh, or an athlete that is preparing for sport, maybe they're like really highly competitive or something's really, um, you know, more serious race, so they just put a lot of stress on themselves. And then you have, or the pregnant mom. I mean, Hello, anybody else that's pregnant? I mean, you're just kind of a disaster the whole time. Uh, right, thank there. Um, uh, and also, you know, whether it's a first time mom and they're anticipating like labor and delivery, we have no, like, you have to really think about all these fears and anxieties that people might have and how this might play in how all these muscles are contracting. We know that the psoas muscles, we know that the pelvic floor muscles react very much to stress and anxiety. It could be good stress and anxiety, but they could be um, overused or underused just because of that. Um, and then we have to deal with all these other emotional factors that are um, coming into play. So we really have to consider that when somebody's coming in, an athlete's coming in, and they're kind of freaking out about all this stuff, um, or again, any of these other types of patients, we have to really take emotion as part of what might be going on um, in the greater um, scheme of things. So response to hormones, relaxing. This I love because I don't want to talk about the stress of the pregnant patient, which we're going to, but just anybody that has had their period and beyond. So females, I think we have to realize there's a lot of research coming out now um, where they're looking at ACL injuries and their um, role of relaxin in them. And they're actually looking at the ACL itself being affected by relaxin and that it's more prone to injury, especially during um, higher levels of relaxin release, which is during um, the ovulation phase of the menstrual cycle. So they're looking to say like, watch this, watch when your athletes are going through these things, are they more predisposed to injury at these times? Um, but I think we really have to look at it is if that's so true for the ACL, think about the pelvic girdle. I mean, there's got to be tons of instability cycling through during your menstrual cycle. Again, I think many of the women have probably felt this already. So when you're talking to your women, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, you really have to determine um, where they are in their cycle and ask them as part of their pain. If they're having this on intermittent pain, you have to kind of ask them if their cycle is a piece of it. But I also think we have to look at it for girls. Um, which we're going to talk about um, in a second with posture, but for girls that are um, doing sports, 
athletes starting prepubescently and then keep on, you know, they're staying with that sport through their menstrual period. So like gymnasts and dancers that are starting at these young ages and then they're getting super highly competitive or where they're cheerleading, whatever. And their menstrual cycle comes into play and their pubic bone changes come into play. Um, and they're still having the same demand and now they have all these other instabilities. Like are they firing the same that they did when they were 10? Or are we really looking at what their strategies are now? Are they, com are they compensating because all these things have happened? They have no idea, their body has no idea what to do with them. Um, or have they been comp compensating the right way? Um, and then, of course, relaxing in pregnancy. Now, this is not, I'm not um, downplaying any role of estrogen, progesterone. That's like, I'm, I could be here for like three hours. Um, but we want to talk about relaxing because it's the main one. And, of course, I think most of us know that it does loosen the ligaments of the um, pelvic girdle, both at the pubic symphysis and at the SI joint. So, of course, we have a resulting hypermobility. Um, so what does that mean? That means we have to be getting stability somewhere. So is that abdominal canister working the right way? Are hip uh, muscles working the right way? That posterior hip, are they really supporting our pelvis and our hip and our SI? And really the strategies, what is going on? How are we compensating for this increase in mobility, whether it's during the menstrual cycle or during your period? Um, I'm sorry, or during your pregnancy. Um, uh, ironically, there are a couple studies about relaxin now, but none of them really show us anything. <laughs> One of them says that um, there's no evidence of correlation between increased levels of relaxin and like you're going to have pelvic girdle pain or pubic symphysis pain during pregnancy. Um, however, there are studies that show that if you have asymmetric laxity, one side versus the other, whether it's from um, during hormone, I'm um, sorry, relaxin increased times or, or not, that you have threefold times of higher risk of developing some type of pelvic girdle problem after pregnancy. So there's all these studies kind of about relaxing, but none of them are really saying what is happening musculoskeletally when this relaxant hits um, the SI joints. Um, and so basically this is it. Our bodies have to account for the increase in um, the laxity that happens around the SI joint pubic synthesis. Um, and how are we, what, what patterns are we developing to compensate for that? Here's the funny thing. So relaxing returns to pre-pregnancy levels three days postpartum. So in history, in like history, doctors and no offense, I'm not saying about way, but doctors or anybody would be like, oh, you're fine, relaxing's fine, SI joint's fine. But what happened is we created these patterns and they don't just go away. We created new habits in our body that do not just go away. So even though the relaxin is better and the SI ligaments might be more stable, we have already created these dynamic patterns that we have to now look at and say, are we firing? Are we going back to our pre-pregnancy dynamic patterns? Likely we're not. And then we have the effect of um, pregnancy on our posture of the pelvis. So um, we have um, lengthened abdominal muscles. We have shortened hip flexors, shortened lumbar extensors, uh, lengthened hamstrings, lengthened pelvic floor, restricted diaphragmatic patterns because of where the baby was, and inhibited glute medius muscle, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and there is a great study right now um, from 2010 that shows these do not resolve postpartum. My, one of my favorite things when patients tell me is like, oh, they told me that it would just go away once the baby was born. Like, oh, that's fine, because um, it will. So um, it will never, the pains will not go away once the baby's born. Maybe some of the pressure will go away, but the patterns are still there. And guess what happens when you have a baby? You have a baby. <laughs> so no one's like, oh, great, I have a baby. Hold on one second. Let me make sure that my dynamic patterns are, you know, firing the right way. You know, our abdominals are still stretched, and all these things are still happening. The baby's not there, but all these things are still there. So um, even as the body gets back to normal, um, after you have a baby, um, a lot of these, um, even though maybe the abdominals are shortening and things like that, again, they're still firing the way they were when they were stretched, unless somebody tells you not to do that anymore. Who here has been told to change their patterns back to how they were before they were pregnant? Nobody. So the fact of the matter is we're carrying these way beyond the postpartum um, time in the year. Like we're carrying them on way down the line, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, and then all of a sudden we're having this pain and we don't know why. Um, so then again, with this pregnancy and the change on the anterior pelvic tilt, um, which is, this is normal. This is supposed to happen during pregnancy. Um, but we know that an anterior pelvic tilt can shut off the gluteus medius muscles. Um, and so hamstrings become a driving force. Or again, we're showing these compensatory patterns. We have studies in non-pregnant women that show any kind of insufficient gluteus medius or hip external rotator or hip abductor can lead to things like high incidence of ACL injuries, um, iliotibial band syndrome, patellar femoral syndrome. So if that's true, if the hip external rotation weakness leads to some of this stuff, what does it mean when you have an anterior pelvic tilt when you're pregnant and then postpartum and it's never corrected and the glute meat is not turning on anymore? Because again, that's a, that's a strategy that we created that hasn't been corrected. So obviously we're way higher risk for those things happening. So then if you have a, a pregnant woman that's running or a postpartum woman, they're trying to get back to some type of sport or activity, we have to keep all that into consideration. 
So sorry, here's another pelvic floor picture. Um, but basically, I think that we have to realize that the pelvic floor is a huge part of the stabilizing forces of the pelvis. And so um, pregnancy itself is the risk factor for stress urinary incontinence, meaning the main risk factor for the stretching and the elongation of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, it's not the actual birth itself, which many people think it is. Why? Well, we have all these postural changes we just talked about. So we have all these anterior pelvic tilts, it's going to stretch out the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor, it's just, it's supposed to be working there, stabilize you all the time. Now has to stabilize you on the stretch and also counteract all the forces that are getting put downward on the pelvic floor. The baby, um, as the baby grows and the baby starts to descend in the pelvis, obviously that's a huge force. Um, our increase in weight when we're pregnant, the SI instability that we've been talking about. Um, and then of course we have all these dynamic changes that happen with the pelvic tilt and the posture. So if your you know, abdominals aren't working the right way, if your glutes aren't working the right way, if your um, multifidi and diaphragm aren't working the right way, there's more demand on the pelvic floor to work even harder to stabilize. So basically it's like an overdrive. Um, so that is either going to cause a complete like lengthening and the pelvic floor is not going to work anymore at all, or it's going to cause almost like a hypertonic pelvic floor. Either way is a big problem that can lead to stress incontinence, um, but really it's going to lead to compensatory patterns and or dysfunction. Um, Diane Lee is like a guru when it comes to the SI and the pelvic floor. I'm obsessed with her. Um, but she has um, some great information on here. And I think really what this is telling you is two things are most likely to happen when you're pregnant. One, the pelvic floor muscles are like a disaster like when you're pregnant and postpartum. So it's either going to happen during pregnancy or delivery from all the stuff that we just talked about. And what happens then? If the pelvic floor is not kicking in, then we have to develop other strategies to stabilize the pelvis. Are those good strategies or are those bad strategies? I'm telling you right now, if the pelvic floor is not working, it's not a good strategy. The pelvic floor has to be working the right way in order for all these strategies, um, in, in order for us to have an optimal strategy for um, stabilization. Or the pelvic floor survives <laughs> magically. So the pelvic floor is okay during pregnancy and postpartum, but what happens is it succumbs to the fact that we have created all these compensatory patterns to make up for this like hypermobility and these postural changes. And so the pelvic floor is basically um, now having to, again, overwork or underwork, and, and everything just kind of just a mess. Um, so um, here's puberty's effect on the pelvis itself. This is what I was talking about before. Just the pelvic girl change itself is that um, we basically have widened, like an opened pelvis. It's not wider, it's just kind of more open to allow for basically pregnancy. So even though these girls at whatever age, 10, 12, 13, 14, or more, um, aren't anywhere near hopefully having a baby yet, um, their pelvis is ready. So we have to, again, remember that these girls that are transitioning from uh, prepubescence to postpubescence as they're going their, through their sport, especially ones that have such a high demand for stability for the pelvic girdle and such a huge amount of flexibility needed on the pelvic girdle and the SI joints, gymnastics, stance. I mean, think about their turnout and where they are. Those imbalances itself are going to probably create a problem, let alone the fact that they now have to account for some of these compensations. So if nobody's telling them to do that, or making sure that they are, we can have a problem on our hands. The athletic pelvic floor is kind of not well understood. There's a huge high, there's a really high incidence of stress urinary incontinence among athletes, um, and there's really not a lot of information on it. Their studies are basically trying to figure out if the pelvic floor muscles are not strong enough to withstand physical stress, um, you know, demanding on their body, um, or are their pelvic floor muscles strong? If we test out a Kegels, is it like five out of five strength? But basically, when they have to have a crazy increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Um, or they're like flipping all over the place like in gymnastics or they're jumping all over the place in volleyball and, and basketball, are they able to withstand that force on the pelvis? So my pelvic floor and um, an athlete, you know, somebody that's a current athlete, <laughs> not me, um, pelvic floor right now might be the same strength, at, but her demand on her pelvic floor is a lot higher. We might be super strong, but she needs a lot more counteractive and again, those strategies. So if it's not happening and there's a weakness of the pelvic floor, that's going to destroy the pelvic floor and again, kind of destroy the whole cycle um, of lumbopelvic strategy, most commonly found in these kinds of um, sports, gymnastics, um, dancers, aerobics, volleyball, track and field, runners, basketball. I think it's kind of obvious. So, I mean, think about these gymnasts, these poor gymnasts, they're pelvic floor. Um, but basically, we're saying repeated um, high impact activities um, but basically cause their personal continence threshold. So, what do I need? What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Everybody's is different and their demand on their body is different. So, is their high impact activities causing personal continence threshold to be exceeded? And that's what's causing some of this incontinence. Again, we just have to think of the integrity of the pelvic floor and how it's firing. Okay, so all of that is bringing us to what we're seeing clinically. Um, so, basically, it kind of go back to what I was saying at the beginning. We're seeing these general diagnoses of this hip pain, groin pain, proximal hamstring tendonitis. 
these are their complaints. They have pain with sitting, they have point tenderness a lot of times at the issue to a brassier, somewhere around the hip. Um, some refer pain into the groin or the posterior lateral lower, uh, lower extremity. <clears throat> it's idiopathic in nature. Most, most of the time they have like no idea where it started. Um, starts kind of gradual, progresses, and a lot of times they have to stop. We see this a lot with runners especially, um, but crossfitters, any kind of aerobic activity. Um, so again, they have to, it's strong enough eventually that they can't do what they want to do. So after they get their um, orthopedic evaluation, um, and this is not saying that the other stuff isn't involved. There's still a lot of stuff that's pointing to like hamstring tendinopathy or um, you know, hip flexor weakness or something like that. There's, there's orthopedic things going on um, and we still have to address those. But basically, um, we're looking at some other things that could be happening that might be either the driving force to this or the result of, but still part of this big pain complex that we're looking at. So what are the patterns we're seeing? Um, when I do the assessment internally, and again, of course, we talk to the patient about it, let them know why they're doing this and why we think this might be a piece of their puzzle. But we're seeing this obturator intern is completely on fire. It's in spasm. It's hypertonic. Um, I ask them to do a pelvic floor contraction, and a lot of times they don't even know how to do one. Um, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I do Kegels all the time, or I was doing Kegels all the time. And I'm like, well, I don't really know what you're doing, but you're not doing a Kegel. <laughs> so um, we're seeing a complete lack of um, awareness of the pelvic floor. They just don't even know. No one, they say that they've been told to do them, and no one's ever taught them how to do it. They have zero awareness of diaphragmatic breathing. I have a runner now who's like an amazing runner. She's like six months postpartum. Uh, I just ran a 5K like over the weekend in 1920, like six months postpartum, which I think is ridiculous. She, she doesn't think it is. <laughs> she thinks it's not good enough. Um, but she has no, no, no ability to do a diaphragmatic breath at all. It's all apical. It's all up here. So obviously right there we know something's off in her strategies. Um, there's a lot of pi pelvic hypermobility. Again, it happens during their pregnancy, immediately postpartum, and then this is years now down the line after they have babies, um, that they just weren't told to take care of their pelvis and kind of like um, have regard for that. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, wait. No, no, sorry. I just want to make sure I got everything on that one. My notes are long. Um, so then we have resulting imbalances. We have overfiring of the psoas, the gluteus medius inhibition. Um, results in the obturator internus overfiring as well, underactive transverse dominus, the pecs are overfiring. If you see a woman that's like, oh yeah, I can do a plank for like two minutes, no problem, watch her. Um, yeah, I bet you a lot of times they're using their pecs, they're not at all stabilizing at their pelvic girdle, and they're not using the right things to get their strength. And this is the pattern that we're seeing, and it just cycles forward and cycles forward. Um, interesting about the um, obturator internus firing over the gluteus medius. When I do an internal, and I check out the obturator internus, what I'll have them do is externally rotate their hip you know, resistively, and I'll resist them. Um, and their obturator internus spasms even more, like it overfires, and I don't feel their glute mead turning on at all. So one of the things I'll tell them is to kind of like kick in their glute mead, kick in the dimple of your butt, you know, that kind of thing. And once they do, their obturator shuts down, which pretty much tells me it's some type of, you know, they're using their obturator like in overdrive. And that's their first, that's their primary mover of the hip instead of being an accessory mover over the hip. Um, there's a lack of research on it. So when we were kind of looking at all this stuff, we we're like, all right, are we, are we like imagining this? Like, is this, is this in everybody? Um, and so I kind of started just looking into it more and more. And there's really nothing. There's really nothing on this, which is really interesting to me. I mean, this seems like it's a huge problem. Um, and there was a one great, great case study done in 2013. It's only one person. But basically, um, she was a runner. And um, it's Pachin L in 2013. And um, she had a she had a diagnosis of um, differential diagnosis with hamstring syndrome and ischial gluteal bursitis. So kind of global in general, but she did, they did do treatment, exercise, modalities, manuals, and in four visits, her primary symptoms of this hamstring pain resolved, but she still had a lot of pain that was underlying, she didn't realize it was there, um, and she still couldn't run. So this, um, it was a male um, orthopedic physical therapist, and he talked to this, he happened to have a women's health therapist in house and said, hey, can can you check her out? Like, let's see if there's maybe something else going on. Um, I think that they looked further into her history, and, and she, I think she was um, pretty early postpartum, pretty recent postpartum. So um, the pelvic floor therapist checked her out, and her pelvic floor was, like, completely on fire. She had, she could not get any strength from the pelvic floor because it was, like, super high, hypertonic. So then they started looking at that and releasing that and treating the pelvic floor and teaching her how to use that the right way, and then as part of a strategy with her diaphragm, in addition to her hamstring orthopedic, you know, physical therapy, um, it led to complete resolution of her symptoms, and she was able to return to, like, marathon running. Not just, like, you know, running like I do, like marathon running. So I think that's pretty um, significant. Um, so these are differential diagnoses that we might see in the clinic, um, and maybe you might want to start thinking about how the pelvic girdle and pelvic floor might be related. Um, 
you know, groin strain, uh, um, OA, you know, because they haven't had any really any x-rays, they're like, oh, you just have arthritis. Um, trochanteric bursitis, labral tears, or, you know, possibility of, but you haven't done an MRI yet. Um, hamstring tendonitis or tendinosis, adductor strains, um, acetabular impingement. Um, here's pelvic diagnosis, SI strain, uh, my favorite piriformis syndrome. Um, it's not even a thing. Sciatica, pelvic girdle pain. So like there are all these things that um, we see. I mean, how often do you see these things, right? So I think, again, I'm not, we need an orthopedic evaluation. We need to see what's going on. But we have to find out, is that the driver, the thing that they're coming for? Is that the driver or is that the result of something else going on? What else is going on? And how do we stop this from happening, not just today or during their PT sessions and this like session of four weeks, but how do we stop it from recurring? It's these strategies that we need to look at. So these are um, some questions I think that we need to start asking, whether it's at the evaluation, their orthopedic evaluation, or like as their treatments are ongoing. So really in their subjective history, this is not just for a pelvic floor evaluation. I think that's the most important thing to understand. I think we have to get comfortable talking about the pelvic floor, the pregnancy, the menstrual cycle, when we're dealing with any type of female um, and female athlete, um, somebody that has been pregnant, um, or somebody that has their period, really, and they have this kind of pain. So um, we want to talk to them about their menstrual cycle. Do your symptoms increase or do you notice any kind of pattern? They might not even realize it. And then when they look into it, they're like, yeah, actually, there is this pattern. Um, what is their sport? How long have they been playing their sport? Is it something that has a crazy increased demand on their pelvic girdle and pelvic floor, like the gymnastics, the dance, the jumping sports? Um, do they notice any kind of instability? I have people that I ask, like, do you notice, like, during your period that you have, it's harder for you to jump, it's harder for you to land? They're like, yeah. So, so like we want to make sure that we're asking these things. Um, history of pregnancies. Have they had, you know, for one pregnancy, have they had multiple pregnancies? Have they had a multiple gestation pregnancy? Twins, triplets. Um, can you think about like what, uh, there's a whirlwind of things that would happen to the pelvis when you have multiple um, babies in there and how much more hormone is affecting it. Um, problems during their pregnancy, their delivery and postpartum. You can see somebody's in their 50s and their kids are 30. Ask them these questions because they might be like, oh, yeah, this, it was a disaster. My last kid was 10 and a half pounds or um, I had I had four. We have a lot of women now, four babies, four babies, five babies like and, and that, oh, but that was like, you know, forever ago. Um, guess what? That's probably part of your problem right now. Did, did anybody tell you how to rehab your pelvis? Do you know if you're working the right way before, you know, before you had the babies? They're like, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you're probably not. Um, especially when you have four babies. So what, what time do you have to like rehab your pelvis? Um, resumption of um, activity post-pregnancy. How quickly were they given? I have a girlfriend that runs like three weeks after. Lauren's fucking left me. But three, <laughs> three weeks after she had a baby. And I'm like, why? Let, your, let everything heal. Do you even know if you're like able to do a contraction at this point? So I don't think that really, I don't even think it's the timeliness of the resumption of activity. I think you just have to make sure everything is working right. So I would just be like, let's just make sure everything's kicking in. Let's just make sure all your stuff is working before you start running. If it's not, that's where we have, you know, the problem or that could become a problem. And then history of the pelvic floor things. These are things that we're uncomfortable about asking, but we have to get comfortable about asking. During, do you have pain during sex? Do you have incontinence? Do you have retention? Do you have a hard time letting go of your urine? Um, do you have any problems with your bowels? Um, those are all things that we need, you know, need to start asking that might lead to thinking, hmm, something else might be involved here. So here's other things, again, in orthopedic evaluation we might want to think of. This is all stuff you could do orthopedically. You don't need um, pelvic floor or women's health to do this. Assess the diaphragm. Can they breathe into it? Chances are they're not. Um, most of us don't. We become like these apical breathers all the time. Um, any trigger points in the abdominals because that may affect how the diaphragm is working and the transverse abdominus and the pelvic floor. Um, palpate the transverse abdominus and not just laying down or in sitting. Can they keep that transverse abdominus contracted when they're getting into sitting? Can they do it for a straight leg raise? Um, can they do it in quadruped? So like it's not just about, oh, good. Okay, yeah, it works. Okay, great. Are they doing that and having that strategy kick in during their dynamic movement? Um, palpate the psoas. Obviously, that's a driving force for a lot of pain and um, might be overactive or underactive. Palpate the obturator internus um, externally. So again, laying down in sideline, um, kind of wrap your hands around the ischial tuberosity, like the inner border, and kind of just press down along the border. Um, and you'll be surprised. I think people I work with, they can see, like, it's a, it's amazing how many people are like, oh, God, yeah, I didn't even realize that was there. It's very similar to the piriformis, but you also want to look at the symmetry between the two. So you don't just want to look at one and be like, oh, that's it. You have to look at both because it's very much like the piriformis where you can pretty much palpate any piriformis in this room and it's going to be like we're going to jump. Um, so you want to make sure that it's asymmetrical as a driver. Um, palpate the sacral tuberous ligament. Again, the high hamstring pain or any of those hamstring strains. Get up a little higher into kind of like the meat of um, the 
um, like from the ischial tuberosity up towards the sacrum um, and kind of that line there, that diagonal line, and you might find that that's on fire. Um, the pelvic floor muscles externally, you can do this. So um, uh, what, what we do is we have patients that you can palpate it um, or they can palpate it. But basically, you're putting two fingers on the perineum, so between the vagina and the rectum, in sitting, clothes on, and they're um, kind of sitting in front of you, uh, like so you're behind them on the plant, and you basically tell them to do a Kegel contraction. Tell them to close their openings, tell them to stop their flow of urine, whatever you're comfortable with. Obviously, you want to let them know that you're going to do this. You have to ask if they're comfortable with it. Um, but say, I'm going to check out to make sure these muscles are working. And you should be able to palpate a lift of that protein. You should be able to feel a movement. You should not be feeling the glutes tight. You should not be feeling, you know, this like, <clears throat> like Valsalva maneuver. If you feel the pelvic floor muscles contract, but you see any of that other stuff, it's also wrong. You should be able to do a Kegel without anybody knowing. I just did one. <laughs> so, so you should not, nobody should know that you're doing it. So if, they're, if you're seeing all these other muscles contract, um, or they can't talk to you while they're doing one, that is wrong. That's not okay. So um, that's when you either have to tell them that, or maybe you know a referral to pelvic floor is uh, pelvic floor therapy is important. Um, you want to test the strength and activation of the lateral hip rotators, the gluteus medius, probably more specifically, and then the co-contractions around the pelvic girdle. So you want to look at how all these muscles are working together. I often have people do a bridge, and then I have them contract all the muscles, uh, or and I see what they're doing. And most of the time they're doing a bridge, and they're like you know crazy extending their spine, or they're over you know using their hamstrings. Um, so basically what I do is have them do some of this stuff. I'll say, okay, now contract your, your lower abdominals, your pelvic floor, um, maybe your glutes, kind of in, in synergy. So that like abdominal canister, I want you to take a deep breath. I want you to pull in your lower abdominals. I want you to contract your pelvic floor. I want you to kick in a little bit of those glutes at the same time. Can you even hold that at the same time before we move? Can you breathe while you're holding that at the same time we move? Okay, can you do that? Okay, now bridge. And look at the difference and how it feels doing a bridge with stabilizing that all around the pelvic girdle. Um, versus when you don't. And then that's what I take into their function. So we do that with a bridge. Then we do that in quadruped, almost like into a down dog. Then we do that from stand to sit or like a wall squat. And then I do that into like standing into like a like a lunge or a warrior type of pose. What you want to find out is not only can they stabilize laying down, can they stabilize in dynamic movement? Um, so a lot of times they're getting it and then I'm like, okay, let's do this and they lose everything or they lose even one of the pieces and that's, that's important. So treatment. Um, Again, back to one of the other slides. The goal is to treat the patient a healthier way to live and move with these uh, this orchestra of movement around the pelvic girdle. And we want to shift from core stabilization to core organization. So it's not about the strength of any one muscle. Um, it's about how they're all working together to stabilize. And if they're not working together to stabilize, what is happening? Where What is the resulting force and why and what could be causing some of the inflammation? I like this because I really use the gluteus medius a lot to, to kind of downplay that, you know, turn down that obturator internus um, when that's on fire. And I just, um, I can pass it out, but it, or I can provide this if anybody wants it. Um, but it's kind of a really neat way to find out like when the gluteus medius is just activation of like the best exercises to use for it, um, which is just kind of neat. Um, and okay, so other treatment. We want to teach them how to diaphragmatic, to diaphragmatically breathe. And it's not just like, oh, breathe into my belly. You know, I'm sorry, breathe your belly into my hand. Like we want to make sure that they are expanding their rib cage. If you're not sure yourself, don't like, don't downplay this. Don't just skip over it or be like, oh yeah, yeah okay, you, you belly breathe. Look into it and check it out. And if I can, I can help you with it. Any of the, my women's health friends can help you with it. If their PRI friends can help you with it. You want to make sure that they can breathe um, with that diaphragm because that is such an important part of your stability. And are you breathing during your sport? Are you breathing during your activity that you need to do? Because um, that's going to kind of be the driver for a lot of those stabilizing strategies we talked about. Um, check out to see if any of those things were on fire when you did that objective, inf um, objective evaluation. Do you think a pelvic floor evaluation is necessary? I can do it. Uh, we have Lauren and Kylene here. They can do it at our other offices. It doesn't have to be like they're now they're a pelvic floor patient, but we do have to look at that as a big part of the synergistic, um, you know, stabilization. Um, and we want to make sure it's working the right way. It could be working great and they're done. We could check out the operator. It may not be on fire. Um, but if it is, why, why would we not check that out? So you can either refer to us. We can co-treat together. We come up a plan, you know, to maybe they come to pelvic floor therapy once a week or, um, you know, whatever works. And they're still doing their orthopedic therapy, you know, twice a week. Um, we can figure that all out. But the important part is to not overlook this as part of the puzzle. Um, education, I think, is the biggest thing. Women have no idea. We have no idea that all this stuff goes on in our pelvis. We just are like, we're pregnant, we're done. Um, we have a period, whatever. Everybody has their period. We think that the pains that we're experiencing are normal. They're not normal. 
All the stuff that happens posturally is normal. All the hormones releasing is normal, but having pain because of it is not normal. It is common, but it's not normal. And so they have to understand the fact that when they're pregnant, that doesn't go, that stuff doesn't go away. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm literally my own subject for that. So um, I think that we have to realize, and I think that's a, a really neat aha moment for my patients when they come into the door, when we're treating them and I'm like, listen, you know, all that swing set analogy or understanding all those changes in their pelvis and how, guess what, all that stuff didn't just come back. They're like, this, it totally makes sense to them. And that moment, that awareness is very empowering. And then understanding what they have to correct is very empowering for them. Um, and then also these athletes to understand the importance of strategies. They're strong. They're like highly competitive. They, they can race, they can jump, they can flip, they, they're successful. But you have to let them understand that if they're not playing in this stuff, right now they might be fine, but tomorrow might not be fine. Or a couple years down the line, they might not be fine. Or when they're pregnant, they certainly won't be fine. Um, and understand that when we're doing these stabilizing strategies, it does not take away from the, like, the flexibility they might need. Gymnasts and dancers are like, oh, I need this turnout. You know, I need this. I need to be like, I need to be in this posture. I'm like, that's fine. But we need to counteract all of that with some of these stabilizing strategies. And even if you're not 100% using that in your sport, which whatever, um, but you need to use these during life then. So then you need to do this as a counteract, go do your gymnastics and come home and do some of these exercises to make sure that you're counteracting it and developing these neuro patterns that become your normal. Develop the neuro patterns that become your normal. We want to do neuromuscular education. We want to consciously know what we're doing wrong. We want to consciously correct that. And then that becomes our new pattern, just like anything else that we're doing. <laughs> I could talk about this forever. Um, well, that's it. That's pretty much where the, the sum of everything going on. So. Do I have any questions? <laughs> yes. For the incontinence. Yeah. So do you treat that when they are pregnant or is it kind of like you're kind of stuck with it because you're in that anterior pelvic tilt until postpartum and then you treat it? No. So you can treat that right away. Yeah. Okay. Um, good question. So we have to still um, correct everything in the current state for sure. Um, and a lot of times the treating incontinence or just making sure the pelvic floor is working the right way will actually kind of help balance some of that stuff out anyway. So it doesn't mean like we're gonna over, you know, completely put a pelvis in neutral, but it might stop, like it might stop a lot of this like excessive tipping or any kind of like, you know, spon you know spinal problem that might happen from that like anterior pelvic tilt being so severe um, in the spine. So, but yeah, doing the pelvic floor while you're pregnant can, is just as important. Um, and in fact, if you can um, work on a pregnancy, uh, during pregnancy, the chance of delivery, uh, like an easier delivery, vaginal delivery is better. Um, and the chance of leaking after you have a vaginal delivery is less. So you have a much better chance of recovering from your vaginal delivery a lot faster. Um, and again, they're kind of, it's almost like preoptive physical therapy, you know, like doing like a prehab. Um, it's kind of like saying, all right, you're going to go in for your shoulder, forget it, we're just going to leave you. You know, if we can do some of those strategies before they're going in for a shoulder surgery or an ACL repair or something like that, they're going to be much better off afterward. Um, but yeah, we can definitely fix the incontinence or at least address it mostly during pregnancy. Yeah, good question. Yeah. What should women be taught after pregnancy in this country that they're not taught? Um, oh my God, everything. So <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I think the biggest thing, I'm, I'm going to actually backtrack that. I think they should actually be taught the stuff during pregnancy. Um, that's number one. I think that we, if we, ideally, I would get people while they're pregnant for a consult and be like, okay, this is what's going on. You know how they have that, like, what to expect or expecting. Everybody, when you're going through pregnancy, talks about, What's happening to the baby? You know, what's happening to your uterus? No one really talks about, besides the fact that you have these postural changes, no one's really talking about all this other stuff that's going on with your musculoskeletal system and what the changes mean postpartum. So I think what they need to know is like, these are the things that are happening. This is normal. It's supposed to happen. We're supposed to have a lax SI pelvis. We're supposed to have this anterior pelvic tilt. These pop, you know, abdominals are going to grow up, like separate, not separate, stretch, possibly separate. Um, I think what we need to know. <laughs> For me, they definitely suck. Um, I think what they need to know is um, something to stretch those strategies. How can we, again, kind of like the athlete, how can we use our muscles as much as we can to make up for some of that la lack of stability? And then how do we take that into postpartum so that we can basically rehab our bodies postpartum to be as close as we can to what we were before we were pregnant? I don't know if we'll ever 100% come back, but I think they need to know that these changes are normal, but that. They don't just unchange. They don't just come back. That we need to teach them how to use their diaphragm, use their pelvic floor, kind of correct, use their transverse abdominis, and how we do that into function. Um, I think the the biggest, you know, per, a lot of women that like kind of 
um, want to get back into some type of um, athletic activity or like workout after they have a baby, whether it's like right away after I have a baby or again, like their kids are growing up. So they're like, okay, I can finally go to the gym. You know, <laughs> And those are the people that are having all these problems because they never corrected those balances. In France, they actually have um, po- um, physical therapy, pregnancy and postpartum is mandatory. It's like part of your care, part of your OBD care. They get, uh, they get a um, home health nurse right after they have a baby home and six physical therapy postpartum visits. And they check out the pelvic floor. They check out the pelvic girdle. They basically tell you all of this stuff. Um, and it's part of it. And you, if you don't, I just learned this recently, if you deny, you can deny it. If you deny your PT while you're pregnant, cause like you're feeling good, you don't get them postpartum. You don't get those visits automatically postpartum. So everybody gets it while they're pregnant <laughs> because they want them postpartum because they know how much of a mess their pelvic floor may be. They know how much this can lead to other things. So they don't want to give up those postpartum visits. So, um, I think that's, I think it's amazing. You know, I think that's something that we're really like. Hmm? Oh my God, I would be the first person online. I think these girls would be right there with me, right? Um, automatic. Yeah, and it's actually really interesting. Um, you guys were over marketing to one of the orthopedic surgeons one time, and they were telling them about some of the stuff that we're doing, like we're trying to do this like combo, like um, pelvic floor orthopedics, whatever. And the orthopedic surgeon said, good luck with that. And they, were, and they were like, why? And he's like, well, okay, you know how you guys get mad at us as orthopedic surgeons that we don't refer enough to PT, like pre or uh, post-op? Well, in OBGYN, like training with that, nobody talks about PT. So like you're really literally beaten on a, on a door that's like no one's behind it. You know, so, um, and when I go in, like we've marketed to all these OBGYNs and they're awesome. Like everybody's like, oh, great, great, pelvic floor, great. But nobody thinks that. Orthopedic surgeons aren't, we have a couple now that are starting to think about it a little bit more because we've been like literally like yelling in their ear. Um, I had a referral yesterday that I actually told her, this, she was in in the morning, it was like eight o'clock in the morning, like, can you come tomorrow? Seven o'clock in the morning to the hospital, like you, I'll just have you stand here and you'll be like the exact person that um, we're talking about. Um, I, and she went eight years, eight years with pain that nobody could figure out. And it's, and, and her OBGYN said, it's not, I don't know what it is, you're not pregnant anymore. And the primary care was like, I have no idea what's going on. And she was finally referred to an orthopedic and then that is how she got to us. But, um, I, ironically it was an orthopedic surgeon referral for pelvic floor and hip. And she was like, you need everything, like everything, you need everything fixed. Um, and she had so much instability. And then she had a lot of that emotional stuff we're talking about. She had, um, a, a very interesting diagnosis for her baby right after she had the baby. She had no idea during her pregnancy, so she kind of had more than that. A year after she had the baby, she had a diagnosis of, um, of cancer of the cervix. So she had a, um, a surgery for that. Um, a year after that, she found out she had endometriosis. She had three surgeries for that. Then right after she had like a crazy um, surgery for like something that happened from the endometriosis, um, this is again, like maybe now we're like six or seven years into it, um, she finds out she's a month pregnant with a baby she never thought she could even have. And she thought she was done having kids. She didn't want any more kids. She was ready to you know, like do a plan early retirement. So like there was all of this like psycho emotional stuff going on as well. And then the pelvic floor is, I mean, it was like strangled um, because it's responding to all this stuff. And also it has this like fear, like no, it doesn't want anything else in there <laughs> at this point, you know? Um, and I mean, that alone is causing havoc in this whole area. Um, and where are her symptoms here? These are her symptoms. She wasn't like, I have pelvic pain, I have, you know, pain within her course. She does, like on, on, on other questions, she does. But that stuff, she was like, uh, she's had that for years. She's had it for years. She didn't even think, her referral, the reason why she went to the doctor was for here. So it's all because of all these instabilities and all this, like, compens- like compensatory patterns and high tone somewhere and something else shutting off. Um, and all stuff that somebody could have told her when she was pregnant with that first baby and postpartum with that first baby. And this last seven years might not even be a doctor. So that's the stuff that, like, I, oh my gosh, I would be the first person on that committee starting, <laughs> starting that program. Yeah, right? I would be there. Um, can you tell that I'm, like, really passionate about this? <laughs> so, does anybody else have any other questions? Are there any questions? Any questions today? But, uh, oh, 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 hi, guys. What do I have to do? Click on. I, don't, I can't even see that mouse. Keep going. Left, left. Your other left. Keep going left. My left? Oh, this left? Keep going left. Keep going. Keep I... going further. Keep going. No, A little further. further. Now you're Where? there. Now no, you it's still... So... Oh! <laughs> How many PTs does it take to move a mouse? Um, no, no.
questions. Oh. We can always... Right here. Oh, sorry, guys. Okay. Um, what's your treatment strategy for sacred tuber? Okay. So, um, Marcus is asking, what's your treatment strategy for the sacred tuberous tissue irritation? Um, basically, a lot of manual stuff. So, you might need to use, you know, modalities and stuff to calm things down, but it's so deep in there that the modalities aren't going to really necessarily hit the ligament. But basically, um, you're going to palpate um, right along the length of the ligament and just kind of do some releases. Um, and then we do some stretching. So anytime we release anything, we want to do some type of corrective exercise, whether it's, again, strategies or um, we want to actually affect that tissue. So we'll release the sacral tuberous ligament, and then we do a lot of um, stretching. So like piriformis stretching, gluteus medius stretching, glute stretching, um, just to try to relax that whole area. Um, I think that's the answer to that. Anybody else? Do you guys have any There's questions? another question here. Oh, oh, sorry. Hi, Nick. Okay, so Nick is asking, are you finding that excessive anterior tilting is causing resultant hamstring inhibition due to inefficient muscle length tension relationship and therefore driving obturator internus hypertonicity? So I'm going to start right there. Yes, absolutely yes. Um, anterior tilting does inhibit the glute med, facilitates a hamstring dominant pattern, but we may be dealing with poor firing of the hamstring since it's like, absolutely, yeah. So, um, that study was just, show, one of the studies was just showing that the hamstring was the driving force for this one study, or the driving factor for this study because of the glute was shut off. But yes, one of the reasons why the hamstring is on fire is because it's not firing, so it's on fire palpation-wise and pain-wise, because it's not firing neuromuscularly the right way. Um, so yes, absolutely, when the hamstrings are not working efficiently, the glute's not working efficiently, absolutely is one of the reasons why the obturator is kicking in um, way too much. So yeah, 100%. Um, for these like high-level athletes, like your gymnasts and your dancers who need a lot of those pelvic floor stability work, would you recommend any preventative exercises to build into their like programs? At the yeah, time? yeah. So what I would say, so first of all, we don't really, well, we really try to stay away from any internal work, right, with with um, some of the younger yeah. athletes. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't check out at least motor recruitment of the pelvic floor using like biofeedback or something. Um, just like the pregnant woman, I would love to instill some type of like, um, almost like the ACL prevention that we do, um, kind of something for the gymnasts and dancers where we're kind of teaching them again, these activities. Like, so are we looking, we'll look at the transverse abdominis, we'll look at the pelvic floor, we'll look at um, the glutes, we'll look at the multifidi and the diaphragm and kind of teach them all those things together and do some like those things I was talking about before, like the bridge, the down dog, kind of make them purposely fire everything, co-contract, co-contract everything, <laughs> um, uh, in like just in supine and then in some of these dynamic function movements, taking gravity away, taking stability away. Um, and I always tell people, like I'll tell my runners, or I'll tell these people like, okay, you want to think about this in function. So like, maybe it's not sport. Maybe it's just like, you're walking to, you're at the sink and you're doing dishes. Are we kicking in? Even sitting here right now, you know, I'll stay here like this. But if I start to kick in all those muscles, all of a sudden I'm in this upright position. Um, yoga, uh, is another thing that I transition a lot of these things to. So I'll teach them this and then kind of teach them like almost like a yoga type of pattern. And that would be like an awesome adjunct to it. So yeah, a hundred percent, I think it would be great, but I think you have to kind of design that program to make sure all these strategies are kicking in. Um, so I don't want to say there's only like one or two exercises. I think we have to look at it together as a whole, like almost individually isolate the muscles so they know where they are and then put them together and then put them together in movement. Uh, but yeah, I think it would be, a, I would love to develop something like that. That's more like, you know, more global without having to do like an evaluation and find out what everybody is doing. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> so rather than like a static core stabilization, you would do more like functional yeah. core stabilization, yeah. like multi-movement? Yeah. And with their core stabilization, you want to kind of look at what they're doing. So, you know, when you do like DLS and you're kind of like, oh, you know, march, and uh, you know, you want to actually look at like, are they breathing? Or, you know, when you're seeing this, you know, on the table, it's like, done, you're done, you're wrong. Don't, like, that's not... So you, so they want to be able to do that, but even right then and there, I'm constantly like, is your pelvic floor contracted? Is your, you know, so are you, are you, are we seeing all these shifts? But where's that coming from? It's not just the abs. Are we seeing that like cylindrical stabilization around the pelvis? So that's what you want to see first. You always want to start first that way and make sure they can do that. Make sure they're using all those strategies together to do that. And then be like, okay, got it. All right, now, yes, we want to go into dynamic movement. Or maybe we'll do it in standing, and then maybe, you know, how we always kind of transition everything from, like, sitting, you know, laying down to sitting to the ball. But now we're looking at not just, like, can you do the exercise? How are you doing the exercise? How are all these other things working? Um, and then you want to get them into more functional movement. What do they need? What's their day? You know, and, and I tell people all the time, and it's something I heard recently, and I love it. Um, I, know, I know Lauren says this, too. Like, I have you for, like, an hour in this room one time a week. So I have you for 
So that's great that we're doing anything, but what's happening once you leave this room? What's happening when you're going into your running, to your gym, the CrossFit? CrossFit. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not knocking CrossFit, but oh my God, like there's no way they're keeping some of these strategies. How are you doing 42 burpees in five seconds and keeping, like, <laughs> like you just can't, you just can't. Um, so, I, I, you know, I have to tell people, like, you have to look at what you're doing. And it's kind of just education. Like, I'm going to give you the education and then you make an informed decision. You still want to do 42 burpees in five seconds? Go ahead. But guess what? This is what might happen. Um, but if you could do, change that and do five burpees in, <clears throat> I don't know, 15 seconds, you're probably keeping those strategies in your life better off. Um, and some of those things were going to be unstable, like in gymnastics when they're doing those crazy flips. I would hope some of those strategies are kicked in. Maybe they're not, but at least if all the other times you can kick in some of these stabilizing forces um, and counteract that, that's a lot of the problem. That's a lot of the bonus too. So. I know, time. We're good, right? Thanks, guys. <laughs> And for those of you online, make sure you email me for your quiz. And uh, for those of you here, make sure you pick up your uh, certificate and uh, leave your feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Here. And we have the other girls here for Peloton too.